In this video, I'm going to describe for you how to uh, use the Diva software to create a new experiment, um, run your samples with optimal settings, and export your data. Um, the first step is to log in. Each user at UC Merced has a unique username for the Diva software. And once you're in Diva, there are several windows that all have different functions. Uh, the first window on the left is uh, called the browser. This is basically a, a file browser. You can kind of think of it as like Windows Explorer to navigate your files in your experiments. Um, this window is called the cytometer window, which has important uh, settings of the cytometer in it, including uh, which parameters are active and their voltages and also compensation values and threshold settings. The inspector window is going to have um, information in it that's specific to whatever element you're clicked on in Diva. So for example, if you're active, activating a plot in the worksheet, you can see uh, properties of that plot. Um, the acquisition dashboard is where you're going to have all the buttons that control acquisition and recording of data. And the worksheet on the right screen is where you're going to see all your plots, um, such as your dot plots and histograms. So the first step to starting to run an experiment is just to create a new experiment. And so if you mouse over this icon that looks like a notebook uh, in the browser, you can click on it and generate a new experiment. Uh, I always would recommend naming your experiment with the year, month, and day convention for ease of organizing your, your files. Now within this experiment, the next step you'll want to do is create what's called a specimen. And that's this syringe symbol in the browser. And you can click on the plus symbol to expand it and you'll see there's a tube under the specimen. The specimen can be thought of as um, a group of tubes. Uh, so this is useful for example when you have, um, let's say you have an experiment where you have five mice and each mouse you have three different tissues. Um, so each individual tissue could be a specimen and under each specimen you could have five tubes corresponding to each mouse in your experiment. That's a nice workflow because it makes it easy to duplicate uh, specimens without data, a very useful command, uh, so, you can, so you don't have to rename all your tubes. Uh, and then you can see under the specimen you have a single tube, and we can add more, but let's start by just clicking uh, on the tube, and now the button to the left of the tube is really important. This is what's going to actually activate that tube. So if you click it, it will turn green. And now a whole bunch of tabs have appeared in the cytometer window. And also you can see in the acquisition dashboard, you can now start acquiring the sample. So the first step um, when you're setting up an experiment is you have to tell the instrument what parameters you want to measure. So we'll click on the parameters tab and you can see all the parameters listed that this instrument can measure <clears throat> and some voltages that the machine thinks are optimal for, the, for each of those detectors, as well as how the data will be measured in log scale and properties of the, of the signal, the area height and width, um, which we'll come back to. So what I'm doing today is just a very simple experiment where I've got two stains on my sample. So I've got um, beads that are either APC labeled, PE labeled, uh, single stain tubes, or a mixture of both. So I've actually got four tubes. I've got completely unstained um, beads, I've got APC labeled beads, PE labeled beads, and then a mixture of both of them. I'm not going to discuss compensation in this video because that's um, a separate topic. Um, these, the two colors APC and PE that I'm using here uh, won't require any compensation because they're, they don't have any spectral overlap. Um, so we will skip the compensating. 
so the first step, like I said, is you have to uh, assign, tell the instrument which parameters you want to measure. So I'm going to delete parameters. Um, sometimes I find that just deleting all the fluorescent parameters may be the easiest way to start. Um, and then we can add them back in. So we always leave forward and side scatter. And then we'll add in by clicking this add button, uh, whichever parameters we want. So I'm going to select PE, and I'm going to press add again, and select APC. And now it's got some starting voltages here that the machine thinks are optimal based on um, um, based on some calibration beads that we run through the instrument. Uh, we may have to change these values, and that's fine, but for now we'll start with the values that the machine has as its defaults. Um, the next thing we'll want to do is come over to the worksheet, and we're going to make some plots. Uh, the first plot is I'm going to click on this dot plot symbol and click on the graph paper area, and I'm going to want to visualize forward scatter versus side scatter. That's almost always the first plot that people look at. And then next I'm going to make a dot plot, and I'm just going to click on the screen again, and I'm just going to look at PE versus APC. Okay. Now I'm going to come back over here to the parameter tab, and it currently has forward and side scatter with the log box unchecked, meaning it's going to record them in the linear scale. That's fine for me. Some individuals choose to look at the side scatter in the log scale, and rarely some individuals like to even look at the forward scatter in the log scale. But I'd say 95% of the usage, these log boxes would be unchecked. And then for the fluorescent parameter, that's almost always viewed in the log scale. The only real exception to that, well, there, there are a couple exceptions, but the, the most common one is when people are looking at um, DNA content, and they're looking for a small change in DNA content. Um, to discriminate cells that are in the G0 phase versus the uh, SG2M phase. And when you're only looking for a doubling of signal, you have to look at it in the, lo the linear scale to really uh, be able to pick out that difference. But for most um, antibodies that tag, for example, surface proteins, this is almost always looked at in the log scale. The area is always collected, and the height and width, I'm going to select those for both forward and side scatter. Um, this is a method, uh, after you acquire, you can do what's called the doublet discrimination if you have these boxes checked. Uh, I won't go into the details on how to discriminate doublets, but if you have these boxes checked, you can do it after the fact when you analyze your samples. Now I'm going to start with my unstained tube to kind of just pick out my forward and side scatter uh, voltages that put my beads on scale, or your, cell, your cells if you're running cells through. So I'm loading my sample, and I'm going to press the Acquire Data button in the Acquisition dashboard. And so what you're going to see is, as the dots come up, you can see that there's some stuff down here in the bottom left and some stuff way up here in the top right. Uh, just from prior experience, um, I can tell that the beads are going to be up here in this top corner based on where I have my, my settings. Uh, so I know my forward scatter detector is set too high and my side scatter detector is also set too high. So what I'm first going to do is turn down my forward scatter. I'm going to drag it down and the population will move. Uh, and you have to hit the restart button to kind of refresh the data on the screen. So now you can see it's moved uh, to the left on the forward scatter, and I still need to bring it down on the side scatter. So I'm going to grab that slider and bring it down to where I have my beads approximately where I want them. Most people want their beads or cells of interest toward the middle of the screen, sometimes toward the bottom left of the screen, especially for lymphocytes. And so now that I have my forward and side scatter where I want them, now I'm going to come over and look at the fluorescent uh, plots. I can already tell the background it looks reasonably high, uh, especially for APC, where I've got signal at 10 to the third for unlabeled beads. 
So I'm probably going to turn that down, but I usually don't turn that down based on unlabeled beads. Usually I turn that down based on the positive labeled beads. Um, because you'll be able to see both the positive and negative population and get those exactly where you want uh, when using your um, single stain controls. Uh, so a point about single stain controls, for every experiment you should have single stains for each fluorescent color you're combining uh, so that you can do compensation uh, appropriately. <clears throat> so in this case I have one tube that has APC, I've written APC on this tube, but it actually has APC and unlabeled beads. So it's important to have both a positive and a negative population for each single stain. And likewise for this one that I have labeled PE, it has PE beads and unlabeled beads in the tube. And so the next step is I'll stop acquiring this tube. And I'm gonna put my PE labeled tube on. And you're gonna notice that over here, I'm just kind of leaving, I haven't labeled any tubes yet. This is just called tube one. And I definitely don't want to record any data at this point. By recording data, you lock in some values like voltage values and compensation values that can become tricky uh, if you switch from tube to tube to keep those things constant. So I find that the best, um, the best way to do this is to not record anything until you've fully completed your setup which is setting all your voltages and performing compensation if you need to perform compensation. Then after that, you can begin sort of the plug and chug phase of your experiment where you just put the tubes on one at a time and record them. Okay, so I'm gonna put the PE tube on and hit acquire again. And what I'm looking for here is I'm looking in this plot to see is my PE signal bright enough while my background is low enough. And so what you're really trying to do here is maximize the distance between your positive population and your negative population. To help make this a little bit easier, I'm gonna first draw a gate. So uh, the gating options are all up here. And I'm gonna draw a polygon gate around my population of beads that I really want. The rest of it is kinda uh, either doublet beads or degraded beads or other contaminants in the sample. So if I draw a box around this, which it calls P1, I can now see in red where those events fall. What I can see nicely is that all this kind of stuff with the tails that's tailing up, none of that is in this P1 gate. So that's good. This is stuff that I'm not interested in. So the way to only visualize the stuff I'm interested in is then to click on this plot and when, you, when I click on this plot, you see that in the inspector, now it's popped up some options specific to that plot. And now I can just click the P1 button, and it's only gonna display for me on this plot what's within the P1 gate, which is what I wanna look at. One other thing is you can see there's some data squished on this axis. Uh, and so to get data off the axis, I almost always on fluorescent plots turn on what's called the bi-exponential display. So if I click the X and Y axis, what you're gonna see is that it's gonna pull the, that data off the plot. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to readjust the scale of these axes, um, but what it's doing is it's allowing, it's, it's allowing you to see the negative territory of this plot, and so nothing will be on the axis, which is usually good. Okay, so the next step I wanna do is I wanna determine and so it's showing me a lot of events here, but let me take a step back. It's showing me a lot of events. In the acquisition dashboard, it's for some reason showing me 100,000 events. I don't really want to see that many events on the screen. Uh, it's going to slow things down, and it's going to make me ref have to refresh more. I'm just going to go look at 1,000 events. So now it's only showing me on the displays 1,000 events, and it's constantly refreshing itself to show me the 1,000 most recent events. Actually, I'm gonna change this to 10,000. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what I wanna do is adjust this PE voltage to where really the difference between these two is the greatest, and also I have reasonably low background. So as I drag it down, let me show you an example of a setting that's too low. Let's say I set this to 300. Okay, now you can see <clears throat> the background is extremely low, but the positive is not extremely positive and there's not great separation. 
Let me go to an even further extreme. <clears throat> Let's set this to 200. <clears throat> and you're going to see now that there is no separation of PE. <clears throat> even though you know there are PE labeled beads in here, you can't see any difference between unstained and PE labeled beads. So this would be an extremely bad situation. You want to have that discrimination. Um, so we were seeing pretty good discrimination probably up in the 4 to 500 range. Let's go back up to 500. So now we can see about a 2 log shift. So that looks pretty good at, at 495. Now I can go up even farther and show you another extreme. Let's pull this up to here, to 700. I'm almost off the chart here with my positive population, and you'll notice my negative population is now at 10 to the third. I still only have a two log shift in my data, right? So there's no greater separation at this voltage setting of near 700 as there was at 500-ish. So this is no advantage, and it's increasing my background to above 10 to the third, which I start to consider that unacceptable if you get over about 10 to the third on your background. And the ex other extre uh, complete extreme is if we went up to 900. Now we've got our data off our axis here, so that's uh, extremely poor voltage selection. So let's go back down to now 500, where we had about our maximal separation, a two log shift, and we also had our background in the PE channel is about 10 to the second. I consider that uh, pretty good. So now I've set my PE voltage to 500. That's where I want it. I'm going to stop requiring, take that tube off, and now I'm going to move on to APC. So I've loaded my APC tube, and remember, I haven't recorded anything yet. I've only even got, still got one tube. I haven't even created new tubes yet. Hit acquire again. I've loaded the wrong tube. So this should be the APC labeled tube. Okay, there we go. And you'll also notice, as I mentioned before, I have an unstained population in this tube and the stained population in this tube. That's really important when you're setting up to have both a, ne a negative and a positive population, especially important for compensation. So now I can see my data is squished up here on the y-axis. That voltage is too high at 632, so I'm going to pull it down, and I'm going to have to hit refresh, or restart to refresh it. This still seems a little high. I'm about to the fifth decade here. Uh, I tend to like to be between the 10 to the fourth and 10 to the fifth when I'm doing a good stain. So I'm going to pull this down to about four, we're at 467, and now I can see I've got a very strong, nice positive. I've got very low background, about 10 to the second, so I've got about a two and a half log shift here. Uh, that's, that's really great. So now I'm going to say this is acceptable for APC, and I'm going to stop acquiring. And notice all these voltages are going to stay the same as what I've set, 467 for APC, 500 for PE, my forward and side scatters are now 495 and 253. So now I've set my voltages. So I know that my voltages are where I want. Um, I've got all the right parameters I want. In the case of PE and APC, there's no compensation needed, so I'm going to skip that step. And I'm now going to show you how to acquire your fully stained sample. Um, the first step is we want to make the appropriate number of tubes. So I have four tubes. And I'm going to click on this new tube icon just to make four tubes. I'm going to label the first one unstained. I'm going to call the second one PE single. I'll call the third one APC single. And I'll call the fourth one all stains. And now make sure you have the appropriate one highlighted with the green button next to it checked. That's the one that you're going to be recording. And now I'm going to put in my unstained tube. I'm going to press acquire data again. And I'm going to tell the machine how many events to record. So it's currently set to 10,000. Um, I think that's a fine number for this experiment. 
uh, you'll want to record more than that if you're, especially if you're trying to identify rare populations of cells. So for example, if you have a cell type that's one in 10,000, as stem cells commonly are, you're going to need to record a whole lot more than 10,000 events, because otherwise you'd only see one stem cell in all your data set. So you'll, in that case, you'll probably want to record, if you wanted a thousand stem cells, you'd have to record um, 10 million events, which would be a lot of events. Um, so you might, you're going to have to figure out what the appropriate amount of data to record is based on what you're looking for in your experiment. In this case, I'm going to record 10,000. Um, I'm going to turn the instrument up to a higher run setting so that this will go a little bit faster. And the status bar is going to show you how uh, far along you are. So we've gotten up to about 5,000 events. Uh, it shows you your event rate, your elapsed time. Um, there are two boxes here. One's called stopping gate and one's called storage gate. I'll come back to that in a second after I change tubes. So it's completed that one. The data appears on screen. Now I can hit next tube. And I'm going to move on to the PE single stain. If you've set it up in this way, all your values here are going to stay constant. These values will be the same from tube to tube, which is extremely important. If these voltage values are not the same from tube to tube, then you're, you can't compare your two samples. Okay, I'm going to move on to the third sample, which is my APC single stain. It's always a good idea to record your single stains so that you can fix compensation issues after the fact. I'm now recording the APC single stain. And lastly, I'm going to record the tube that has all our stains in it. And I'm going to cancel that because I've forgotten to hit next tube. Make sure you have the correct tube highlighted. I'm going to acquire and record. And what you can see in this plot here now is we can draw a gate. Uh, first, let's bring up our population hierarchy by going to population, show population hierarchy. This will show you your gating hierarchy. So we've got all events. Under that, we've got our P1 gate. And now, if under our P1 gate, we want to just display, sorry, we want to just gate um, these populations, the APC positive population, the PE positive population, or the, or the unlabeled population. We can click on the P1 gate, and then select your tool. I'll, I'll make a rectangle this time. And that will be labeled P2. So I can label just the APC positives. And then I can keep repeating this process to select all the populations. And I can easily see the percentages now of those populations within the sample. I'm going to return to this uh, stopping gate and storage gate. So stopping gate, we had initially selected 10,000 of all events. If, for example, you wanted to record 10,000, you knew exactly, I want to, I want to, I want to record exactly 1,000 of the APC positive events, you could change this to P2. And now it will keep recording data until you get to 10,000 of the P2 gate. Um, so all in all, it will record P2 is 45%. So it'll record about a little over 20,000 events if you do this. There's another option called storage gate. You can only choose to store the data of the events that fall within P2, for example. I don't recommend doing this unless you have a good reason to do it. For example, if you want to, if you've got a lot of debris in your sample you want to eliminate, you might select P1. Uh, to s only store the things that are within this gate so you don't overload your file with useless data that may be down here, the debris, or red blood cells, for example. Um, because you can't get that data back after the fact. So if you store only P1, you'll never be able to look at any events that were outside of that P1 gate. 
Okay, so now that we've recorded and gated our samples as we want, I can toggle through and just make sure all the data is there from each sample. And now I want to um, export my data so that I can analyze it on a third party piece of software. Um, most commonly, this is done using uh, programs like Flojo or FCS Express. And there are two export options to take your data off. Um, the first is to export the experiment file files. If you right click on your experiment and click export experiments, it's going to prompt you where to, to put it. Um, and so you'll just choose your directory and you'll export the experiment. Now that's that's good if you want to back up your experiments so that you can re-import them into Diva. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is you may want to visualize how you gated it or you may want to use that experiment as a template for another analysis run. Uh, when you export it as an experiment, it will save um, things like your color scheme that you've selected, it'll save your gates that you've drawn in the exact location. Uh, and so you could re-import this file and see exactly what you're seeing now. The other export option is if you right click and go export FCS files. This is going to um, export as an FCS 3.0 or 3.1 are the commonly used ones. Um, and those FCS files um, that are exported as FCS files can be viewed now accurately in Flojo uh, or FCS Express. Um, if you try and load the experiment files into Flojo or FCS, you may have issues. Uh, so I don't recommend trying to do that. And so now you just click OK and uh, choose your file path where you want to save those files. And then you can transfer them off um, via the network or through a flash drive. So that concludes what I wanted to demonstrate on some basic generation of an experiment, uh, setting up voltage settings and parameters. Uh, we did not cover compensation, uh, that is another topic, um, and we uh, optimized our settings, recorded our data, and exported the data.